Welcome to the Entrepreneurship Forum. April 1st, April Fool's Day, but um, we're not going that route today. It's uh, going to be my uh, privilege and uh, pleasure to uh, introduce John T. Nielsen. John is uh, on the uh, Liquor Control Commission and uh, also represents uh, lobbyists at the uh, legislature. So today he's going to talk a little bit about some of the actions and activities in the legislature and talk a little bit about the Liquor Control Commission. And um, why is that, why is that uh, pertinent to entrepreneurship? A um, lot of uh, restaurants and uh, private clubs and uh, all these different entities uh, depend on, uh, on liquor licenses. And uh, there are limitations and uh, we want to kind of talk a little bit about that. Uh, John and I uh, go back a uh, long ways and um, we are um, the best of friends at least, aren't we, John? So, you bet. And um, I think that you're uh, going to be um, very impressed with this uh, speech. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn the time over to John T. Nielsen. Thanks, Rick. Uh, he forgot to mention that we're related. Uh, my daughter married his son. <laughs> and uh, of course, we'd go back long before then, but we're very fortunate to be part of the Lambert family. Great people. And uh, likewise with the Nielsen family. Oh, thank you, Rick. Uh, the past classes that I've taught for Rick, I've usually spent most of the time talking about the Utah State Legislature, which is uh, something that I know quite a bit about. I have represented in my private law practice clients there over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. But, and, I, and I come today to you as a retired lawyer. That's the reason I don't have a coat and tie on. I refuse to wear them anymore. Uh, but it's uh, nice to be able to do what you want to do rather than what you have to do. So part of that uh, freedom comes in, in terms of choosing uh, activities that may uh, require some of your expertise and allow you to at least remain somewhat involved in the community, uh, which I have been able to do. And what I want to talk to you about today, uh, f for the most part, is, uh, as Rick indicated, the Liquor Control Commission. But let's just take a minute or two and talk about the Utah State Legislature, because it is, to most people who don't understand it, a complete mystery. Uh, and the uh, media and the pundits have great uh, fun making fun of the legislature. There, is all, there are always some uh, legislator who files a ridiculous bill and it tends to get a, a lot more attention than all of the good things that the legislature does. I, I would say on balance that if you look at the results of a legislative session, and, and certainly people may have differences with respect to the results, but by and large, the Utah State Legislature does a pretty good job. Utah is, is consistently ranked as among the top one or two best managed states in the United States. Uh, the reason for that is that the legislature is fiscally conservative, it is conservative with respect to social policy and other issues that tend to uh, uh, rank Utah uh, in that category of states that are the envy of many because we don't have the kinds of financial crises that you see so frequently in the east and on the west coast. So. Uh, the legislature always will have some controversial issues. We had a number of them this year. Uh, Governor Herbert's uh, Healthy Utah plan was, uh, was not passed. Uh, there are a variety of reasons for that, uh, both philosophically and monetarily. I haven't got time to discuss them, but I think that's going to be revisited in a special session perhaps and something with respect to Medicaid expansion is likely to pass. Because there is this, what they call a donut hole, with regard to the Affordable Care Act and what we are able to cover under the Medicaid program. So there are a lot of people who 
uh, are not either Medicare or Medicaid eligible. That is, they're not over 65 and their, their, their income does not qualify for Medicaid. Many people in the state don't have employer-sponsored health care and they have to go into the individual marketplace, that is the Affordable Care Act exchanges, in order to obtain insurance. And if, they are of, if they're not eligible for the subsidies, if they're not eligible for Medicare or Medicaid, and they don't have employer-sponsored health care, there's a certain um, amount of people in our population who just can't afford health insurance. The Healthy Utah program was to attempt to close that donut hole by expanding the poverty level and allowing more people to qualify for subsidized health care through the state. I personally think that something needs to be done to assist those people who find themselves in that very, very difficult position, and some of you might be there. So I think you're going to see some adjustments in uh, the way health care is financed in the state of Utah in the, in the near term, if not in a special session, probably next year. The other major issue, of course, was the relocation of the Utah State Prison. That, that is still very much an issue as to whether or not it ought to remain out in Draper where it is now or whether it ought to be relocated some other place in the state. And there are equities on both sides. Uh, the area where it is now in Draper is, is prime uh, property for developers, both uh, housing developments and other kinds of high-tech developments. And the developers are salivating to get their hands on that property. And uh, they want to relocate it somewhere maybe in Tooele County or maybe west of the Salt Lake City Airport. There are a number of locations that have been suggested. All of them have pros and cons. Uh, my guess is there is a very strong likelihood that it may remain right where it is. Uh, or it may be located in Salt Lake City, and you probably heard that the legislature sweetened the pot a little bit by allowing a municipality to raise property taxes a bit sufficient to help pay for the offset that would otherwise occur by the prison locating in, in otherwise prime taxable property. So we'll see what happens. So uh, keep your eye on those issues. Uh, for those of you who have never spent any time at the legislature, I would urge you to go up and do that. How many have ever gone up there and watched the process? There are a few of you, about three or four of you. Uh, as citizens, you ought to take the time to at least go up and see what happens. Uh, listen to some of the debates, watch the floor activity, and see how the American democracy really functions in the context of our legislative bodies. Uh, I'd urge you also, uh, you're all of now of, of age where you can participate in the political process by voting and otherwise, get involved. If you don't like what's going on, don't grouse about it. Get involved some way and support those candidates or those issues that f you feel strongly about. Now that's a, that's a pretty good segue into the subject of today's talk. And that is one of the areas that causes as much controversy as any among many people is the liquor laws in the state of Utah. There's an impression that uh, Utah liquor laws are very strange and very weird and unlike anything else that exists in the United States. That impression is completely erroneous because our liquor laws are no different in many respects than you find in, in most of the jurisdictions in, of this country. In fact, there, in, there are some states where they allow county options and the counties are absolutely dry. They don't, there's no way you can buy alcohol in some of those counties. Even in our neighboring states of Idaho and Wyoming, their liquor laws are not a great deal different than what we have in Utah with the, with the sole exception that you can purchase wine in the grocery stores. And that's about the only major difference. But people grouse about Utah liquor laws. Uh, you have to go to a store, a liquor store, sir. Yeah. 
Um, so like, isn't the in-state, so like Utah, it's like almost 3% less alcohol content than like out-of-state? Yeah, I'll talk about, I'll talk about that in a minute. Or like I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec, sir. Also to the whole free pouring rule in the state of Utah. The what is it? The free pouring rule, basically utilizing attractions and mind Yes, that's so correct. Any other state that does that? I don't know. I suspect I don't know if there is or not. But there are there are some very some very unique aspects. But to suggest that we're the only jurisdiction in the United States that has a weird liquor law is just not true, because there are many of them in in other jurisdictions as well that people grouse about. But but those primarily are uh, complaints about the fact that you can only buy liquor in the store. As I mentioned, you can't get it in a grocery store. Uh, the uh, in a restaurant, you can't uh, have a drink unless you're in, you have intent to dine at the, at the restaurant. And of course, many people grouse about the fact that the beer you buy in the local grocery store is like drinking water. It's 3.2 alcohol by weight, and it's not strong enough. And anything beyond that, you have to go to the liquor store to purchase. Uh, uh, I, I think the impression given to, uh, about Utah is that Utah is, is kind of a dry state. It's tough to get alcohol here. Nobody buys it. Uh, again, that is just not true. Uh, I, would, I would encourage you when you drive home, those of you who are going north in particular, or when you're driving on I-15, when you get to about 15th south, look west and you'll see a great big huge gray building. It's 10 stories high and as large as a football field. That's the liquor warehouse for the state of Utah. That's a huge facility. It's jammed completely full of alcohol of, of, of virtually every kind. And uh, it's an amazing place. And, and anybody who has an interest could go out to the alcohol control offices and they take you on a tour. It's completely automated. Uh, when the liquor stores request certain inventory, it goes into, it's the, there's a person there that types it in the computer. A, uh, a uh, machine on a rail goes around, finds it, takes it off the dolly, uh, brings it down, they, they, they shrink wrap it, and it's off to the store. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting process, and it gives the distinct impression that Utah, there's a lot of alcohol consumed in this state. The liquor is, is sold through state stores, as I mentioned to you, and I'll say more about that in a moment. But that is an important source of revenue for the state. The state reaps millions of dollars in tax revenue off revenue generated from liquor sales in the state. I just thought it might be interesting to, uh, to briefly go through some of the history of U uh, regulation of liquor in the state of Utah. Prior to Prohibition, uh, there was no statewide uh, regulation of, of the consumption of alcohol at all. It was pretty much on a county by county basis. Um, of course, with the passage of the 18th Amendment, uh, we had enacted uh, prohibition in this country where you could not manufacture or consume hard liquor. Uh, interestingly, that was repealed in 1933. And guess who cast the last, the state that cast the last vote to, uh, to uh, abandon prohibition was the state of? Utah. Utah which often, often is an interesting uh, uh, fact that most people don't realize. Uh, then you had a variety of other kinds of uh, regulations that were passed over the years. In 1935, the state passed, after Prohibition, the most comprehensive liquor laws. Uh, they uh, enacted the, what we have today is called the state control uh, state control of the sale of alcohol where you could only buy it in the stores. And that, that has existed since 1935. In 1968, there was a, uh, many of you maybe remember this, some of you older, older here in the room, the liquor by the drink vote, which failed on a two to one basis. Uh, but after that happened, uh, the state legislature was encouraged by the governor to create a system of liquor control 
that uh, met the needs of those who consumed alcohol, but also protected uh, those who didn't and made very certain that the laws that were enacted uh, did so in a way that avoided overconsumption, made sure that violations of the liquor laws were punished appropriately, and made some changes to the DUI laws in the state of Utah. Uh, in 1969, we had this very curious law passed that uh, many re remember as the mini bottles in stores and in clubs. Uh, that lasted a few years, but eventually uh, it, it simply did not appear to be practical. And in 1974 through 78, there was a huge scandal that occurred in the Liquor Control Commission. Uh, several of the bureaucrats and the commissioners were accused and actually indicted by a grand jury of taking bribes and of uh, taking lavish trips and of, of doing things that were completely inappropriate. Understand that the companies that produce alcohol are very anxious to get their products in the states. And in the past, they would do just about everything they could to try to encourage the people who ran the alcohol control in the states uh, accepted their product. And in 1974, there was a big scandal about that very issue. Uh, in 81, Utah enacted the Dram Shop Law, which I'll talk about in just a minute with respect to third party liability. Uh, and in 1990 through 91, there was a, again a big task force that was, uh, was uh, uh, put together by the governor's office to replace the mini bottle uh, store to a calibrated pour that I think still exists pretty much today. Since then, there have been a number of uh, amendments to the liquor laws, and uh, unfortunately, in 2011, we had another scandal where the director of the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission was accused of giving his son or his son-in-law some sweetheart deals on, on uh, per the distribution of alcohol in the state. Uh, there was... Uh, there were allegations that the commission, in fact, was, was playing uh, fast and loose with the way licenses were, were doled out to folks. And the legislature rewrote the liquor laws again. And uh, they created a seven-person commission uh, that is appointed by the governor. governor. Uh, that commission uh, is consists of both Democrats and Republicans. Some of us are uh, drinkers and others are not. Uh, it was created to do a number of things I'll talk about in just a moment. And also to be a regulatory body for the, uh, the actual people who run the alcohol beverage control uh, in, in the state of Utah. Uh, one thing you need to understand is that there are two aspects to liquor regulation in the state. The first is the alcohol beverage control uh, section of the government is run by full-time state employees. In addition to that, you have the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission, of which I am a part, which uh, does, uh, our, our function is to oversee, to make sure that the uh, bureaucrats are doing their job and to oversee licensing. The commission does not set the liquor policy for the state of Utah. And notwithstanding some media outlets and others who constantly complain about the commission's activities, we don't set policy. All we do is interpret what the legislature tells us to do. So we can't do anything that the legislature doesn't give us the authority to do. We have a certain limited amount of what we call rulemaking authority where we can interpret to a degree legislative intent. But by and large, the Liquor uh, Commission is bound by what the state legislature tells us to do. So if you have a complaint, about liquor laws in the state of Utah, don't show up to the commission and carp to us about it. 
go up to the legislature or talk to one of your legislators about uh, the liquor laws. If you don't like the Zion Curtain, if you don't like uh, 3.2 beer, if you don't like the intent to dine regulations, uh, complain to the legislature. Sir. Um, so the, uh, you know how like in Colorado, Washington, and I believe Oregon, so they have, you know, a legal marijuana. Yeah. So with Utah, do you think like we, they would change the age of the alcohol drinking? Limit? Like, would they be able to do that, the state legislature? Sure they could, if they wanted to, but it's like never going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> like I mean, there are, there are some things that I can tell you are not going to happen in Utah. Number one, we're not going to legalize marijuana. And number one, they're not going to lower the drinking age. Wasn't there okay. one vote away, though, from yeah. legalizing marijuana? Well, it was medical marijuana. Yeah, that's... Okay, that's a whole different thing than legalizing the possession of marijuana for recreational use. Right. Exactly. And uh, medical marijuana is a different issue. And it has, some, it has some virtues, I think. And maybe that we'll see that path. I don't know. But that's about the extent of it. And, that, and medical marijuana would be very highly controlled by the state. We wouldn't do it, but somebody would. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Exactly. So do you regulate what goes on, like, policies in the liquor store that goes on? Because a lot of policies that yeah. just are enacted by employees in the liquor store seem right. inappropriate. We, we don't do that uh, directly. That's pretty much left up to the executive director and his or her staff who run the alcohol beverage control aspects. Now, we have, the commission has two subcommittees. One is the operations subcommittee, the other one is the compliance subcommittee. Compliance is pr pretty much has to do with the regulatory aspect of the licensing and so on. The operations subcommittee deals with what you're talking about. They oversee uh, how the bureaucrats manage the alcohol uh, distribution and so on, including the stores. And if, if that group sees that they're not doing it appropriately, uh, we have the ability to make some changes there. Now there, has been, there have been some very recent complaints, you probably have seen them in the paper, about the termination of a couple of employees in the uh, wine stores. Uh, Utah does have a couple, three or four specialty wine outlets uh, where, and I, I really never understood how important that is to some people in this state, and there was some controversy over, on, with respect to that. Those are the kinds of things we would have an opportunity to look at. Um, yes, sir. So, so far, can you like make a list of like the committees and the, and the stuff that you've talked about so far that are in place in Utah? So like we could do further research after this. The, the committees? Yeah, like the committees and, and like what you do, like commissions, stuff like that. Yeah, I'll tell you what we do in just a sec. So uh, in fact, that's a reasonable time to talk about that thing, that right now. But before, I wanted to, I wanted to read to you the mission statement. This is, this is something that the legislature sort of put together. We have adopted it as the mission statement. And you get a sense of, when, when I read this, of what the alcohol policy is with regard to the state of Utah. The mission of the Department of Alcohol Beverage Control is to conduct, license, and regulate the sale of alcoholic products in a manner and at a price that reasonably satisfies the public demand and protects the public interest, including the rights of citizens who do not wish to be involved with alcoholic products, and will promote the reduction of the harmful effects of overconsumption by adults, consumption of alcohol products by minors, and impaired driving, and promote the public interest by enforcing the Alcohol Beverage Control Act in a way that is fair, impartial, consistent, and equitable. So what the state has tried to do, and many argue that there is, a, there is an imbalance, but at least what they have tried to do is make certain that alcohol and liquor is available to those who want to consume, but also make sure that those who are uncomfortable with it are not burdened by uh, those who consume 
and uh, protect particularly minors who might be influenced by watching alcohol be consumed or watching it be prepared and so on. I'll mention a little bit more directly about that in a second. But you ask about uh, the commission. Seven members were unpaid, were volunteers, were appointed by the governor for a term, uh, two terms if we want it. Uh, we make rules, uh, as I indicated, to implement the policy of the legislature. We deal with licensing of establishments uh, who sell liquor and the permitting of those establishments. We can also regulate those licenses by suspending or revoking the licenses if in fact the entities that we issue them to do not comply with the state liquor laws. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, I think, to this lady here, uh, we are the governing board that really reviews the activities and day-to-day -day operations of the department. Now, we are not micromanaging the department, but we have at least the obligation to oversee what it does. As I indicated earlier, Utah is one of 18 states that is what we call a controlled jurisdiction. That is, the distribution of alcohol uh, is controlled by the state government. You can only buy it, alcohol, uh, in the state stores. Uh, if you have a, you want to buy alcohol from some entity that you uh, know you cannot buy that directly from them. You, it has to either be shipped to the store and then you can go pick it up. Or you can go into the store and find a variety of products uh, to purchase. But it's all done through the state regulated stores. And uh, as I said, that's a very important source of revenue to the state of Utah. Now, some argue, in the legislature in particular, Senators Dubacus and Madsen, that the state ought to abandon its monopoly on the distribution and sale of alcohol, that it ought to be privatized, that we ought to, we ought to move that out into the private sector and let entities like grocery stores and Costco and other uh, big retail entities sell liquor and let them reap the, pro the profits from it and get the state out of the alcohol regulation business. Uh, again, like I just told you, the chances I think of that happening, at least in the near term, are virtually nil. Uh, and, and, the, and, and there's a practical reason for that is the state depends upon the revenue stream to a very, very large degree that is generated through these stores. Uh, you have a question now. Yeah, uh, so yeah, with the, like the regulation, why has it like increased in like severity as opposed to like not t today, as opposed to like, so let's say the 1960s where like, you'd get like a slap on the hand or something. If, like, I don't, I wouldn't that. necessarily say that it's increased in severity. Uh, there have been, there is greater scrutiny, if you will. Yeah, scrutiny. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that the state has increased the number of, of officers in the Department of Public Safety who are the regulatory body that go around to the clubs and to the restaurants to make sure that those entities are uh, adhering to the law. And any time you have more officers doing that, you're going to have see more violations. So if there's, a, if there's an impression that it is more severe, it is probably as a result of increased enforcement. And uh, I think that's a, a fair way of, of looking at it. Uh, I think certainly the elimination of some of the rather archaic and stupid regulations like the mini bottles and the private clubs and those kinds of things uh, there has been a loosening, really, and Governor Huntsman, if you recall, in I think 2009, he was, he was a, a proponent of loosening up some of the liquor laws in the state, and some of them were. 
Uh, some of the things that were, were considered to be archaic and, and unworkable were eliminated. So I think we have, I think we have uh, at least in my judgment, a proper balance in terms of the availability of liquor and the regulation. Now, there are a couple of areas that uh, people really grouse about, two in particular. The first is what uh, was termed by the Salt Lake Tribune, uh, creatively, called the Zion Curtain. Anybody know, everybody heard that? Zion Curtain in, in means in a restaurant, you cannot have the preparation of alcohol, the distribution of it, uh, seen by patrons in the restaurant. There has to be some kind of a barrier that eliminates the possibility of, of seeing alcohol being poured and prepared and distributed. That has been very controversial for a couple of reasons. Number one, a lot of people think it's stupid. And the main reason is, is that any of the restaurants that were in operation before the law uh, came into effect were grandfathered and they don't have to comply. So you've got this, these two entities doing different, I mean the same entity, the same license, doing two different things. Uh, there have been attempts in the last few years to eliminate this, uh, this Zion Wall concept. It has not happened yet. Uh, I predict that maybe within the next year or two you might see some uh, alteration of that to make it a bit uh, more sensible in the way it's administered and to eliminate this uh, unfair dichotomy of the grandfathered restaurants as opposed to those who have to comply. The other area that rankles a few people in a restaurant in particular is we have what's called an intent to dine law. So if you go into a restaurant, you can't go in just to have a drink. You've got to go in with the purpose of buy, having food. Uh, the reason for that is that the legislature doesn't, they want to keep a clear distinction between clubs and restaurants. They don't want the restaurant to turn into a de facto club where people can just go into a restaurant not with any intention to have any food but just to have a drink. Uh, if you want to do that, you got to go to a club, but you can't do it in a restaurant. You can have a drink, to be sure, but you've got to order food, and you've got to go in with the intent to dine. Again, that, uh, that's troublesome to some people, but nevertheless, that's the policy the legislature has enacted, and they want to try to keep a clear distinction between the restaurants and the clubs, and that's one way they do it. You've got more questions. I know. But go ahead. So this is somewhat off topic, topic, but it still has to do with regulations. All right. So you know how California is like deregulating the energy, their energy, um, which means like more uh, companies can now like provide that service. Do you think Utah will be following suit r relatively soon? Like solar, in to like uh, yeah, I think there will be some. I think there will be some changes as as green energy becomes much more available, solar en energy, uh, wind power, and so on. Uh, I think there the public that that's not regulated by us. That's regulated by the yeah. Public Service Commission, right. and there will probably be some some changes. Uh, you look at Idaho, for instance. Those of you who maybe go up through Swan Valley out of Idaho Falls, there's a huge wind farm up there. And Idaho generates a fair amount of its power through wind power. And I would suspect that when they did that, they made some regulatory changes. So yeah, you probably see some. Yes, ma'am. Um, regarding um, purchasing requirements solely through a state mm -hmm. store, um, and then having to to have um, special orders come in. Yes. Um, that's one time I found myself in a situation where I was looking to um, purchase a specific bottle of wine mm -hmm. for engagement, mm -hmm. and I was unsuccessful with getting it here in Utah because it wasn't a typical bottle that was, I guess, approved by the state or whatnot. So I had to forego not having what I wanted because of the laws that the state has prohibiting. Mm -hmm. 
ordering items right, that yourself. are outside of their normal stock. Right, that's correct. And uh, this is one of the, and, I, and I, I have to confess to you, I'm not completely conversant with these specialty orders, particularly with regard to wine. I know that there is a special order program, and uh, you're probably familiar with the wine stores that deal with this, but the, the, the issue is one of inventory control. Uh, the state wants to be able to turn this stuff over on a regular basis, and they don't want certain products to be sitting on the shelf forever because the state doesn't make any money on that and it, because it's not being sold. It's so demand, it? it's, yeah, it's a bit of supply and demand, and, and a lot of people who like specialty wines carp about that because they want to have available, I mean, you probably understand wine better than I do, but I mean, you go into an Idaho or any other place where you can buy it in stores and there are row after row after row of different kinds of wines. And, and, and people who are sophisticated understand the differences. <laughs> and there are some differences, aren't there? Oh. And some people like these specialty kinds of wines, and, and it's, and sometimes, and maybe you ran into this problem, the distributor won't sell you just one bottle, you gotta buy a whole case. And uh, that's not cheap. No. And so there are some of those issues, but, but mainly I would suggest that it's an inventory control issue in the main. They wanna be able to turn this stuff over and the real specialty kinds of wines are typically not turned over regularly. So I don't know what your problem was, but... Uh, what, 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 we had found a, um, a company out of Italy that we wanted to bring wine in, and we were ordering enough specifically for our event, uh -huh. and it was denied to hmm. allow us to bring it in. Um, it wasn't going to be an inventory product, it was okay. a drop ship. Okay. And they would not allow it to be drop shipped at their locations. At, at the liquor they store location? In yeah. Utah. I don't know why that would be the case, because I know, I, and there must have been a reason, but the reason would escape me. I just don't yeah. know. And you would certainly have been entitled to a reasonable expon explanation, and if you want to follow up, please do. Yeah. So we'd be interested in knowing that. Yes, sir. Um, so why is there only a certain amount of liquor licenses, why isn't it more regulated? Because good point. a certain amount of licenses doesn't that restrict a lot of business from coming. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. And I was just getting to the licenses because Utah issues a, a whole bunch of different kinds of licenses. You have the club license, which is divided into a couple of categories, dining clubs and social clubs. You've got uh, tavern licenses, you've got full restaurant, limited restaurant, uh, banquet and catering, reception centers, resorts, airport lounges, uh, a whole variety of, of, of uh, licenses. Each one have their own peculiar regulatory issue. Uh, in, the, in the past few years, the state has expanded the availability of a majority of those licenses. But the one you're talking about in the main is called the club license. They are the ones that are in the greatest demand, and they are regulated by population. And understand that this is not just an issue of uh, the state wanting to limit the number of clubs, because the clubs want to limit the number of clubs. And they're not interested in having a prol proliferation of a whole bunch of club licenses out there because it diminishes their competitive uh, business. And they, they rather would have a, a corner on certain kinds of markets. But the club license is the one that is, is the most in, in demand and the most difficult to get. Now, in two years ago, the state passed a law that just came into effect this last year, which allows club licenses to be sold. In the past, they could only be issued through the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission. But now, licenses become a property right, and they can actually be sold. And they become a very, very, uh, <coughs> valuable asset. In many cases, they can be much more valuable than the value of the business itself. 
And we, we do have some ability in the commission to control uh, how those licenses are actually sold and bartered. But they now can, in fact, be sold and become a property right. So if the club license is not available uh, because of population, uh, and they can find one that's available to be purchased within the county, they can do that without having to worry about the uh, commission actually issuing a license. Question, sir? Yeah, so with that, hasn't it caused a problem where there are now people that have no intention of owning an establishment buying these licenses yeah. to trade them as a commodity in the future? Is there any works to actually protect the citizens that are actually trying to open establishments? We're, I think that's one of, the, one of the things that we have the ability to look at very carefully as to what the intent of the purchaser really is. Is it to simply hold on to this thing as a valuable asset and, uh, and hold it? Uh, there are some regulations that if in fact you do that, you can't, you can't just hold on to these, these licenses forever because it's unfair to the people who want them. And we look at businesses uh, who are, let's, let's say there's a, an operation that has closed down. They still have a club license. And there appears to be no intention of that uh, operation ever opening again. Uh, in, a, in a typical case, that license is going to be forfeited by the commission and be available to somebody else. So we're going to watch that. This is, this is very new. We haven't had to deal with these uh, bartering and exchanges of licenses before. And it's something that we're going to look at very carefully for the very reason that you've suggested. Do you have a time limit on it? There is, uh, not, not yet on these, not but on, yeah, on the others, uh, I don't remember what it is, but it's, uh, if, it's, if you're closed down for a certain amount of time and you're not going to reopen ever, it's going to be forfeited. We're not going to let people hang on to those forever. It's not fair to the people who want to have them. Uh, another question, sir. So would you say that with the number of licenses that we currently have that we're running at op, like close to optimal efficiency, or would a larger amount of licenses actually bring in more business and more? Uh, yeah, space? and that, that is a perennial argument. Uh, there are those who feel that there ought not to be quotas on club licenses that if, any, if anybody wants one, they ought to be able to get them. I mean, there are plenty of licenses available for, for restaurants. Uh, the, quota, the quotas on there are huge. I mean, there's, I don't recall we ever ran, have run into a problem of not having enough licenses available. But the clubs are, are, are a different situation. And as I mentioned to you, there are reasons for that. One is a policy reason, the proliferation of uh, the sale of alcohol, and the second is, uh, that the clubs like to keep them in a, in a limited fashion. Uh, I think you'll, you'll see, as, as you've seen in the past, that the state may uh, change that demographic some so that uh, the population requirements that are in the current law are liberalized so that there may be more availability of club licenses. Yes, I'm going to give somebody else a chance, yeah, okay? Go ahead. Um, how do you differentiate the difference between a restaurant that serves alcohol and a club that serves food? And why is it so important to keep the two separated? Okay, that, that's a good question. Uh, much of it has to do with, with minors. And let me just talk about club licenses in particular. There are two kinds. There's the, the uh, social club where alcohol is available. No minors are allowed. There's a dining club, which you are required to separate the, uh, the bar area. Uh, but minors can be there in the restaurant area if, in fact, they're accompanied by an adult. Uh, the restaurants are different because, uh, and there are, some, there are some food requirements. You have to have food available in this dining club. And there has to be a certain percentage, I think it's 60% of the sales have to be food as opposed to alcohol. So they don't want to turn these, they want to keep a clear distinction between the social club and the dining club. The dining club is different than a restaurant. 
because you know, minors can, can come into the restaurant without, without restriction. They don't necessarily have to be accompanied by an adult. These are all policy distinctions by the legislature to protect primarily young people from being around the consumption of alcohol. The counter argument to that is why should the state be concerned about that? This is a parental issue and people ought to be responsible for their, their own kids, but, but the state wants to act in loca parentes. They want to act in a way that, from a policy standpoint, protects youth from uh, consuming alcohol and, the, and being around it as a cultural thing sometimes increases the consumption of alcohol. Uh, the commission, of course, feels very strongly about uh, minors consuming alcohol. And one thing that we take a very strong position on, if we find minors in establishments where they shouldn't be, and particularly if alcohol is being served to minors in restaurants or in clubs, if they, and there should be no reason ever that a minor is served alcohol in a club because of the monitoring that is required to go on in clubs with the, um, what do they call it, the scanner. And uh, any of you in here have a driver's license that's vertical instead of horizontal? Yeah, some of you who are younger do. And if you are under 21, you're going to have, you, show them your license. I don't have an auto. Don't you? Okay. Yeah. Don't drive. <laughs> Somebody have one? This is a, this is a I'm, I'm an old guy, so I have, a, I have a horizontal license. But there's one right there. But if you're under 21, you're going to get a, you're going to get a vertical license, which ought to be evidence to the server or the people watching the door who's supposed to be there and who's not supposed to be there and who's supposed to be served alcohol and who's supposed to not be served alcohol. So there shouldn't be any excuse. And when we see these kinds of things being ignored or winked at, we'll come down pretty darn hard on the establishment. Okay, I don't see any other hands, so you can have another question. Like You're just about out of your quota. But, uh, yeah. uh, so like, it's actually in regards to this. So like, you know, like, Kids, I know I had friends that had fake IDs. Sure. So, how, like, first of all, that, and then, like, how does parents empowered influence the commission? Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the other? I'll take the that's, that's a good question. So, uh, wasn't the legal limit in Utah? Wasn't it 18 at one point? At one point, like yeah. Earlier, but what was that date? Oh, I can't. I I honestly don't recall. Maybe, you, oh, sir. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, and I, I put a caveat here. I'm I'm a Mormon, and just out of curiosity, why though does the board feel it necessary to have people who have no idea what alcohol consumption is about? Why do they feel it necessary to? to have folks on the commission that, okay. quite frankly, have no idea. It's basically like a white guy serving an African-American celebration committee. They're, they're, it doesn't make it a sort of sense. I think that's a really good question. Let me answer his question, because yeah, that, more, that's yeah. one that comes up all the time. Remember what I told you before. The commission does not set policy. Our job is a, essentially a business regulator. And from my standpoint, I don't drink, but I understand and I appreciate the need for people to run a business as unencumbered by state regulation as possible. Uh, we are not there to Im impair a legitimate operator doing his or her job, whether or not they sell al alcohol. All we do is interpret the law and enforce it as the legislature gives it to. There are four members of the commission who don't drink, three who do. Uh, and I think if you talk to those who don't, who are the, uh, the uh, imbibers on the commission, I think they would tell you we have never had an instance ever where there has been a, an argument 
or a reason to think that those who don't drink are somehow uh, do not understand the business opportunities that should be available to everybody. It just, it just is a non-issue with us, at least with the present commission. One more question and then yeah. better turn it over to Rick. Yes, sir. Um, I think this was in regards to inventory control, but uh -huh. is that why it is illegal to bring a keg in from another state because they want to be able to control that? Not necessarily that it is a higher point beer. It has nothing to do with inventory control. It's just part of the laws of the state. You can't do that. You can't import uh, alcohol without it going through the state uh, stores. And if you do, it's a violation of the law. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Rick. One question you didn't ask John, and uh, this is a question that we addressed when we had lunch one day, when he announced that he had been asked by the governor to serve on the Liquor Control Commission. And my question is, John, you're a retired attorney, why would you do that? <laughs> and uh, it was a, uh, John is a, uh, is a public servant. He uh, pays it forward and is trying to uh, at, uh, do his best to keep it in balance. And um, I appreciate that, and I hope uh, you as students, uh, whether you're imbibers or not, and whether you're going to uh, be involved in private clubs uh, or restaurants in the future, appreciate the uh, task that uh, uh, John and the rest of the Liquor Control Commission have in making it fair for everyone. So with that, I think let's give John T. a great hand. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you.